How do we build a world of equitable financial recovery? That's the World Bank's group yesterday released its 2022 World Development Report, which looks at the interconnected risks that could trigger a global financial chain reaction not seen in many generations. Flagging off the new report with a virtual discussion was the president of the World Bank Group, David Malpass. His presentation was followed by a panel of four discussants, which includes James Mwangi, the group CEO of the Equity Group Holdings of Kenya. Let's listen to Malpass and Mwangi. As we're all too familiar, the COVID-19 pandemic and shutdowns have created the most significant economic crisis in almost a century. It's challenging the effectiveness of civil and institutional structures uh, around the world. And it's adding to fragility and violence uh, that's facing many parts of the world. The result is a crisis for foreign policy and for development policy, as well as economics. In 2020, economic output contracted in 90% of countries and the global economy shrank by 3%. Global poverty rates rose for the first time in more than 20 years. Inequality has worsened and the poor and the most disadvantaged were hardest hit by the downturn and are being left behind in the recovery. The recovery itself uh, is uneven and faces many hurdles. Geopolitical tensions and fragility are major recovery risks as we see every day. New diseases and pathogens are at risk, as are existing ones and COVID variants. The World Bank Group works extensively on healthcare systems around the world to bolster preparedness and provide a variety of surge financing tools. Inflation will be hard to stop and hits the poor the hardest. The two primary tools being considered seem unlikely to be enough. Gradual interest rate hikes would still leave real interest rates low or negative. The second tool, tapering central bank bond uh, asset purchases, still leaves huge distortions in the global financial system. Under the current post-monetarist system, central banks have two other tools, financial regulatory policy, that's a topic of today's discussion for developing countries, and also the duration of central bank assets and, uh, and the duration of government debt. The use of these two tools will be a key variable in reducing inflation more quickly. The current global support for bond issuers continues to concentrate capital, wealth, and excess government spending in a very narrow segment of advanced economies. It's the inequality that we observe every day. This comes at the expense of small businesses, slow growth in median income, and reversals in development. The misallocation leaves weakness in productive investments, in jo job training, and in the logistics needed to improve supply chains. That's not an argument for faster interest rate hikes, which themselves cause damage, especially on new businesses and on developing countries. Rather, it's an argument for governments and central banks to use more of their tools at the same time. Rather than central banks buying back and owning large, long duration debt, there needs to be more focus on lengthening the maturity and transparency of all levels of government debt outstanding and slowing the growth in national debt. There needs to be the same focus on debt transparency and sustainability in advanced economies that we have been advocating strongly for developing countries. Similarly, it's vital that financial regulatory policy in advanced economies recognize the importance of working capital and trade finance as we are doing in developing countries even in today's report. Floating rate small business loans form the financial foundation of development, yet will be severely disadvantaged if central banks simply rely on interest rate hikes to try to get ahead of inflation. <clears throat> the new WDR focuses on developing countries and on the interrelated economic risks and spillovers between the balance sheets of households, businesses, financial institutions, and governments. 
and also on the central role that finance needs to play in supporting a recovery. The report discusses a variety of financial fragilities and risks. First, private debt is at a record high and credit conditions are tightening. A growing share of businesses are expecting to fall into arrears. A new wave of loan defaults would lead banks to tighten their lending standards. This is pro-cyclical, deepening the downturn. It worsens inequality, typically hitting low-income households and small businesses the hardest. And second, sovereign debt has also spiked during the pandemic. It's reached new highs for some governments as revenues plummeted and related COVID-19 expenditures soared. Surges in domestic government borrowing can crowd out lending to the private sector and misallocate capital as banks shift their lending to governments and expose banks to concentrated sovereign risk. These are the topics of the in the WDR, some of the topics in WDR today. So as monetary policy tightens in the advanced economies, debt servicing and rollovers will become a greater burden. It's critical that risks be uncovered and managed early. The alternative, protracted debt crises and restructurings, risks derailing growth and development for years. To work toward more sustainable debt, a top priority is improved transparency of both public and private debt. This helps detect financial risk and enables the proactive management of debt. We need effective restructuring tools, both for government and private debt. Currently, there are no predictable or orderly systems for sovereign debt restructuring, and the implementation of the G20 Common Framework is stalled. For the medium and longer term, continued access to finance will be critical to a robust recovery. Innovations in technology, including digital payments, will be central, especially for low-income households and medium and small enterprises. Let me conclude by saying that I'm very pleased with the timely release of this report, and I commend it to you. Uh, the financial sector will only be successful if it works hard in hard with governments on, uh, that allows policy uh, change. Unfortunately, most of the governments of developing countries uh, have no headroom uh, to be able to put stimulus and uh, significant impact. And they have not uh, had a big impact and have um, really focused on the social aspect. So uh, for, for the government at the moment, the best is to really create elaborate partnerships and try and harmonize, uh, particularly the public-private sector uh, uh, collaboration, which can really mobilize citizens uh, to play a more um, larger role. I think the bigger private sector, uh, banks like Equity Bank, uh, I think needs to be incentivized by government so that they play more of a developmental uh, role uh, where they don't really focus on the financial sector, but six partnerships, whether it's with the development banks uh, or whether it is uh, with um, uh, the philanthropic world, so that the approach they take is not the traditional financing and commercial approach, but is a developmental approach that uh, builds the financial capabilities, uh, provide financial tools, but more importantly, to ensure the bulk of the, um, the population is not left behind, uh, then uh, as social interventions, particularly capacity building, so that people are able to bounce adversely affected, and then uh, hopefully have a mix such that it's not the short-term financing of banks, but uh, it's a, a mix of long-term development financing uh, together with the commercial bank financing to allow recovery and particularly uh, to also allow development of local and regional supply chains to replace the broken uh, global supply chains. Another uh, aspect is policy change. This then means that uh, if the private sector is to play a developmental approach, there must be policy uh, a change that allows uh, that and particularly links uh, the micro and macro uh, policies so that uh, then the, uh, the lead economy 
uh, can then be able to play an active role. Whether these will then uh, look at incentives, uh, whether these will work uh, in uh, collaborations and partnerships on a case-to-case -case basis, or it is more of sectoral law um, approach, I think it will depend from one country uh, to the other. And the last one is then also uh, for governments to think uh, really how to deal with um, um, crowding out the private sector. We have realized the banks have responded uh, by really looking at the risk uh, perspective. And part of the looking at uh, the risk perspective of lending because of the high NPLs uh, has been uh, more take the sovereign risk. And as a, more of the government tries to uh, fill in and replace the lost income in terms of tax uh, revenues, uh, through debt uh, collection, there should be uh, they should strike a balance uh, such that they don't crowd out completely a private sector that then is uh, playing a very significant stimulus law uh, to the real economy. So that is how I see where the government can come in and uh, take a more like um, in East Africa may be a more regional approach other than a national approach may help so that um, uh, cross-border trade uh, and investment then plays a bigger role uh, in uh, bringing back the recovery uh, and stimulating recovery than maybe government. So the issue of looking at markets and um, maybe sacrificing a bit of sovereignty uh, to regional uh, policies that allow cross-border trade, that allow larger markets, that allow or maybe ease mm -hmm. of trade, maybe a, a way to approach this uh, recovery.